books that I worked on started with looking at safety and looking at clinical studies. So nothing came remotely close to the fun and the joy I had in, in the rainforest, but something very necessary, which was to really pull together all the studies for the medical community so they really understood how to use these um, plants safely and how to advise their patients on using plants um, for medicine. So that's kind of was my, was my foundation of most of the work that I did. Um, but when I was here in California and moved back to the area, I realized that so many of the plants that had the research on them were native plants to our region here. In Northern California, we are so blessed to have such an abundance of um, native plants that are both beautiful in the garden and also um, have many uses. So I started a journey of gathering together as much information as I could um, both on the science and the safety and also the practical uses and the traditional uses um, and really experimenting on myself and my family uh, first and foremost. So I have a five-year-old and a 13-year-old and all the recipes in my book have been tested on both of them. So um, if they like something then it goes in the book. Um, if they don't it doesn't. So. That's uh, been a fun journey for our family and something that I continue to add to. So this is the second edition. So after the first edition came out, um, and I still have this as a strong desire, is that the community writes to me and gives me their recipes and their ways of using the plants um, for food and for health. And um, so it's an ongoing journey that I'm, I'm really excited about uh, you participating with. So, I'm going to start, if that's okay. Please. Um, so I'm not sure you can read that quote, but it says, it's a Gary Snyder quote, it says, nature is not a place to visit, it's home. And so when I say living wild, all I mean by that is um, a way of developing a close relationship with the place that we live. So the place around us, the place, the land where we inhabit, really becoming closely connected to that. And realizing that it's our home. So I'm going to tell you, um, I'm going to give you five reasons why I think it's worth doing what I'm calling living wild. And the reason um, I'm going to do that is because th this is not as convenient as going to the grocery store. So I'll just tell you right now that it's not going to save you a trip uh, to the store and it's not as simple as that. Um, but I think it's well worth the journey. So the first reason um, is related to, um, I don't know if we can dim the light. I'm trying, but I'm really trying. There we go. Um, cultivating an independent, carbon neutral lifestyle. So what that means is, you know, an example of this is really in, in the oak tree. So has anybody watered their oak tree lately, an oak tree around them, you know, given them extra water or pampered them or tried to do anything? Well, you know, that's an example of a, a plant that, um, you know, it can grow on a steep hillside. It doesn't require irrigation. And, you know, one single oak tree, there have been reports of, um, you know, producing up to 2,000 pounds of acorns. So when you look at that um, in, the, in the context of a way to, uh, you know, grow a local food without adding a lot of compost, a lot of irrigation, a lot of fencing, um, and really connect to um, what we can grow right around us. So, it's easier, it's easier than uh, traditional gardening. Um, secondly, uh, enjoying something that's actually gluten-free, vitamin-rich food. So, um, you know, again, these plants are beautiful, but really, is there any reason we should be eating them? Um, so, I sent samples of some of our local fruits, uh, native fruits, to uh, the laboratory for testing to find out uh, what their antioxidants are. So that's one measure of um, a plant's uh, usefulness. And as you can see, the elderberry and manzanita specifically um, are three times higher in antioxidants than blueberries and pomegranates. 
So again, here we have in our idea a way of we're going to all run to the store and you know get our antioxidants from all of these things that are not native to our area. And yet right in our backyards, we have access to um, you know, plants that do create uh, a lot of antioxidant benefit and health benefit for us. Um, so I also did um, testing on acorns. Um, when I say, you'll see that I refer to acorns as oak nuts. So if you hear me say oak nuts, uh, I've, they're the same old acorns. Um, but I call them oak nuts because if you say acorns, people tend to think of squirrels. And they think of something a squirrel might be wanting to eat. But if you say oak nut, this is an oak nut, then it sounds like something that you know you might want to have for dinner, for dessert or something. So it sounds a lot more appealing. So I'm kind of rebranding the uh, lowly acorn and uh, giving it a more dignified status of oak nut. So again, I sent some of uh, different types of species of uh, oak uh, nuts to the lab for testing, and you can see the protein content um, on the black oak was very high, um, and then the canyon live oak had the highest in essential fatty acids. But really, ultimately, all of, of the types of uh, acorns um, from any species of oak are edible with the right processing, and we're going to go into how to do that um, later. But um, no matter what source you have, they're all gluten-free um, source of, of uh, nutrition and um, higher in uh, essential fatty acids and vitamin A, folate, um, than wheat flour. So, um, nature deficit disorder. Um, so this is the third reason um, that I'm giving you. And it's hard to believe that our society could have another disorder. But evidently, we, we do, and it's called nature deficit disorder, which basically just means people aren't spending enough time uh, outside. So um, this uh, is a quote from John Mueller up there, and it says, the mountains are calling, and I must go. So you can see the kids heading out. But um, studies have shown that the average American can name um, over 1,000 brand names but cannot name 10 native uh, plants and animals that live in the area where they, they live. So over a thousand brand names, but not even 10 native plants or animals. So um, that's something that I, I hope will start to change. Um, but with kids spending an average of seven and a half hours staring at screens, um, we're losing some of the connection to nature that kids naturally, naturally want to have. So, um, in the book, I've included a page just on spending time outdoors um, as a family with our kids. And uh, spring, these are just some examples that are in there, but it's um, seasonally based. Eating flowers, those are the manzanita flowers, um, which are wonderful to eat. Um, these are all art projects, games, and things you can do as a family. Um, that's my son gathering, helping me gather my... Uh, Oak nuts. So um, the fourth reason is around cultural knowledge. And um, so our local landscape of plants supported indigenous people here for thousands of years without grocery stores. Um, so how did they, how did they do it? Um, unfortunately, we, we've lost a lot of uh, what I would consider the user's manual for how to know how to live in this landscape um, and that would guide us to what plants uh, we would actually enjoy eating instead of just things that we um, could eat if we were lost in the woods and, and they wouldn't kill us. But what would we actually enjoy eating? What would we like to eat? Um, so I've tried to include um, as much information as I can. Um, I have a section in the book um, on uh, some of the, the indigenous plant names um, for some of the species. And it, in many cases, the name indicates the use. So that the name of the plant itself um, in, uh, in the indigenous language tells you what it's used for. So it's a different way of naming plants than we have, but it's uh, very useful. Um, 
So, um, the final reason here, um, before I go into sort of a seasonal look at some of my favorite plants and their uses, um, is around protecting uh, biodiversity and, and habitat. So, you know, as everybody in this room knows, gardening with natives can really help create habitat for, for wildlife. Um, and there's more than 6,300 uh, species of native plants here, and a third of those grow nowhere else on Earth. Um, so, <clears throat> basically, you know, being aware of what's in our environment, having a deep appreciation for that, um, and for those plants, um, can really help us um, maintain the plants that we we have and realize their importance and, and try to protect them. Um, so I'm going to start on winter and just go through a few of um, my favorite plants in each season. And getting started on this, um, some of the uses that I have in the book um, are based on traditional use, and some of them are based on science. Um, and I, it's really fascinating. One of the things that I really enjoyed when I was working on this book is when all of those overlap. So when the traditional use and the scientific study um, both confirm um, the same uses of the plant. So we'll go through some of those. Um, Bay, California Bay, um, is everybody familiar with that plant? It's very abundant here. Um, I'm gonna pass this around um, and just squeeze a bay leaf and take a a little sniff, not too big of a sniff, um, very strong, but um, bay, California Bay can be used just like uh, the Mediterranean species in soups. Has anybody used bay leaf in, in their soups or California Bay? So it's, uh, I find it to be stronger than the Mediterranean species, so I use about half of what um, is recommended in uh, the recipes. Um, the nuts are useful. Also, um, as far as medicinally, um, bug repellent. So if you have an issue with mosquitoes, thinking that you're tasty in the summer, um, an easy thing to do with bay, um, and I do combine it um, oftentimes with mugwort if I do have access to both of those plants, um, is just uh, very as simple as boiling water. So. Many of the things that I'm talking about tonight um, are really, if you can boil water, you can make this as medicine. So it's very, very simple. Um, Tea-based medicine is a primary form of health care for much of the world's population. Um, and it's very effective. Um, so, but anyways, the bug repellent, um, that's externally. Um, you don't want to be drinking it, um, but you would just, Take a mason jar, you know, you just take a mason jar, fill it with bay leaves, and pour hot water over it, and then let it steep overnight. So, um, and that's a great, and again, if you have mugwort, you can combine mugwort in there. Um, if you have uh, uh, pennyroyal or coyote mint, those are also good um, bug repellents that you can combine in. Um, you'll see household cleaner and disinfectant on there. Um, that's, I clean my house and have for the last uh, about three years now um, with a California Bay. And I do pretty much the same thing I just was explaining to you with the uh, bug repellent. Um, but I combine in Douglas fir and um, I also combine in, you, and again you don't have to. Um, I do, uh, again, pour the hot water over the, the bay let it steep overnight, pour it into an empty spray bottle, and add a little bit of um, distilled vinegar. And I clean the wood floors, disinfect the countertops. Bay uh, was traditionally used um, in the area that I live in. Um, the Maidu Indians are in that region, and they make uh, bark houses out of cedar. And uh, they would line the bark houses with bay to keep the bugs away. So it's a good way to repel um, bugs from your house as well as um, disinfect your, your countertops. Um, so again, these are seasonal things. So bay is, is really year-round, so it's, it's abundant and it's available the leaves year-round. Um, rose hips, um, 
Again, this is, um, there's some fun, you know, drinks that you can make. Uh, I do have a section on some alcoholic drinks uh, for those of you that want to try um, going down that path. Uh, it's an interesting direction to head with your native plant uh, adventures. But, um, so you can make a, a beer, a mead, a honey, honey beer out of um, rose hips. Um, again, just like the Yerba Santa, so dessert that's medicinal. Um, there can be alcohol that's medicinal, and in fact, um, again, many other countries um, have a medicinal <coughs> drink that's um, also fermented um, that they take as a daily tonic um, that's actually good for you. So um, there's rosehip mead, um, and obviously the rosehips, if you, you're not aware of them, they are very high content of vitamin C. So that's um, why they're listed uh, for colds, coughs, and sore throats. Um, incense cedar. Um, do you have cedar this low? I mean, is it, do you have any, anybody have incense cedar around here? Some couple people nodding. Um, so you may, you may or may not have it here, but um, it's useful, um, again, uh, to take and steam uh, for those coughs and sore throats. What I do is put it into a, a pot of hot water and just use the steam, you know, cover your head with a cloth and breathe in the steam for uh, lung congestion. So that's really helpful. Um, the housing, that's what I was referring to, the cedar bark um, is used to make housing. Um, and the book is organized, I don't think I really explained this um, very well, but you'll see these different categories, medicine, um, cultural and functional art, food, and then um, everything is color coded. So I tried to make this as easy as possible um, to help me remember everything too. So you'll see, um, you know, food is red, and then you turn to the red section and you look up the recipe under that plant name. So um, medicine is blue, same thing. You look up um, how to make it into a medicine, the details are in the section, and it's alphabetized. Um, and if it's an art, um, it's a different color. So it just kind of goes in order like that. Um, just to make it as simple as possible. Um, and purification and ceremony, if you do have um, cedar, what you can do is use it as incense. I mean, incense cedar, it's, it's called that for a reason. And you can bundle it up um, tightly with a string and then let it dry and then burn it as incense. So that's also something that is, is done with incense cedar. So toyon, does anyone have toyon? growing in your yard or nearby. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite plants. It's very easy to grow, um, so it's, it's a very uh, good plant to get started with for a native if you don't have one growing. Um, and I love Toyon gets its berries in the winter. So as you can see, this picture actually has snow um, there below the Toyon bush. And, um, I struggled for a long time to figure out exactly how to prepare toyon berries and actually make them taste good. Um, so what I found is if you dry the berries, they sweeten up. Um, it did, they do not taste good if you just try to munch into one um, on the bush. Um, but if you, do, if you do dry them first, um, you can grind them into a powder. So a lot of this is about how do you make this really practical and useful in your daily life? I mean, this is all nice and interesting, but are we actually gonna go home and, and really integrate any of this into our daily lives? So one of the ways I found is easy to do is to put things in spice jars, um, like some of you tasted the manzanita before. And this is a toy on spice, and um, I'll taste it first to make sure. Um, it's kind of tangy, um, but this is basically dried toyon berries, and then they're ground up. So I'll pass this around for any brave souls that want to taste it. Um, and uh, what I do with a lot of these is like this, I, I add to my cereal in the morning. That's a good thing to add toyon to. Or if I make a stir fry of vegetables, um, I'll add that one in as well. Um, the toyon cider, is very simple. You just take the berries, and this is a little tangy. It's not super sweet, so um, unlike the manzanita. But um, I just cover the berries with water and simmer it for about 20 minutes, and um, make the cider. 
And again, it's a good source of antioxidants and wonderful to have in abundance in the wintertime when there's not a lot of other plants um, available. <clears throat> and floral arrangements, I did put that in because some of these are just beautiful and last a really long time as an arrangement. So around the holidays, um, it's really nice to, to add toy on berries to your arrangements. So if you guys have questions as I go, feel free to stop me. Yes? You, you mentioned at the beginning, many of these are a combination of traditional uses yes. and scientific. Yes. No, I mean, you don't want to How does it overlap? Yeah. Um, I'll go through some of the science, um, you know, I'll let you know on some of the uses, but what I did in the book is I put a page in there that's just summarizing the scientific studies on one page for um, people that are really interested in what has that kind of validation. And then I have another page that's just dedicated to safety. Um, just, you know, so you can make sure you feel comfortable. So some of the ones you're on medicine. Sort of medicinal uses of a couple of those. Medicinal uses; those are based on traditional use. The ones that I've talked about so far. Yes. And and of the recipes, do you call out what is a traditional use in terms of the foods? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, covering acorn flour with organic dark chocolate is not a traditional use. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, that's, there's, a, there's some things that have just been experiments and adaptations to really see, uh, you know, what, what we would enjoy tasting now. Um, uh, but some of them are based on traditional uses as well. So um, the Toyon cider is based on a traditional use um, and the Manzanita cider as well. So, um, and we'll kind of, I'll try to go through and point those out as we go. Um, so those were some highlights from winter, and we're almost to spring. And uh, is everybody familiar with this tree, mm -hmm. redbud? Um, another beautiful, beautiful, and very easy to grow uh, native tree. Um, redbuds. Um, so a traditional use here, like in the cultural and functional art, you'll see for baskets. Um, so. Uh, <coughs> They've been used traditionally for um, basket weaving um, and just uh, you know, gathered in actually the winter, um, late winter, early spring um, for baskets. So, um, and then a non-traditional use um, that I've found and really enjoy is adding them to salads. So the flowers are um, kind of mild tasting, they don't have a strong taste one way or the other, but over some uh, fresh greens in the early spring, um, it just, they're really beautiful. Um, I've also made a cornbread um, that I've adapted just with a layer of red bud flowers um, on the top, as well as uh, red bud flowers mixed in. Um, and that's delicious and beautiful as well, yes. Do you find there's any particular dressings that work well with it or not? Or? Dressings? Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. Um, well, a fun native plant uh, dressing that I'll go into a little bit later is the from the manzanita sugar, um, just from the manzanita berries. You can make a really delicious manzanita vinaigrette, um, which is great. It just um, is really easy to do. So that's what I, I that would be, that's my preference. You know, if I can do it that way. So. Do you prepare those uh, red buds? You know, there's you nothing you really need to do to prepare it. You just take them off the wash tree and rinse them off. And, yeah. With some of the flowers, um, like the manzanita flowers, you need to make sure there's no ants on them because if they're sweet, um, you know, I, I tend to, especially I found this with manzanita. Um, as soon as they're very, very sweet, the ants are very attracted to them. So you want to just gently shake off any ants um, that got there first. But yeah, besides that, there's not really any other preparation. Um, yarrow. So this is a wonderful summer uh, plant. I'm not sure why. So yarrow is wonderful. Um, you were asking about yarrow. Um, I have a recipe for making a yarrow beer in there. So that's one fun thing you can do with yarrow. Um, another medicinal use is um, using it for wounds, for wound healing. So um, if you cut yourself, you can use it um, to 
Do I need to be doing something? Nope, nope, I'll handle it. No worries. Um, it's great. It's antiseptic, back, antibacterial, and it stops bleeding. So um, it's good for, for any wounds. Um, Um, another use that's approved um, in several other countries. Um, so other countries tend to treat the native plants differently as far as um, uses go. Um, so Germany, for example, and England, um, they have official books that are published uh, by the government that, uh, that say, you know, you can use yarrow for this use and you can get reimbursed uh, from your insurance for um, using that plant for that use, and it's, it's, it's kind of officially approved. Um, so, bidding account for your native garden. It isn't. <laughs> <laughs> so yarrow, um, yarrow is used officially um, in um, several countries. It's approved for stomach disorders. Um, so mild, um, this, they call it this but it's basically any kind of mild stomach disorder, stomach ache. And that's just making a tea. Um, and it can be from the you know, upper flowering parts and the leaves um, is the best thing that's so, approved. So like on the wounds thing, you said it, yeah. it helps to uh, prevent <coughs> the bleeding maybe. So are there, it's a traditional use. It's a traditional use. But and are, are there some experiences where they, the people would even say, yes, it does. It may not be approved by the government. Or? Yes. Yeah, and I and I have extensive experience, extensive experience with it as well. Yeah. yeah, with the wound healing specifically, and um, it's really cute because every time my son, who's five, cuts himself, he says, "I'll go run," or or somebody in the family cuts himself, so say, "Just wait a minute, I'm going to go run get the yarrow," and he'll just <laughs> run outside and find a yarrow leaf and uh, pick it and use it to stop the bleeding. So. Um, it's it's really sweet. It's I think it's the first plant that he's really kind of gotten a relationship with. So it's, it's neat to see. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering, um, does this work with dogs and stuff too, or yeah, as far as that? as far as what part? Well, as far as wounds. Yeah, I, I haven't tried it, but yeah, I, I don't. There would be no reason it wouldn't work on a on a dog's wound. And in fact, too, on some of the things like the bug repellents and stuff, I've heard from other people who have used that on their dogs, like the Bay, California Bay, um, as a bug repellent or a, a you know, flea, that kind of thing, repellent, um, that would be something to give a try to as well because uh, it is re effective in keeping bugs away. So, um, but I don't have any direct experience with that, um, with yarrow for wounds on dogs, but if anyone does, please let me know. So you use the yarrow as a pole? Yes, as a poultice, and uh, honestly, you don't really need to do, a poultice just can be a crushed up plant, as simple as that, and you just kind of can crush it up, and um, sometimes it's moist and sometimes it isn't, but with the yarrow, I often just crush it up a little bit in my hand and then press it on, um, just like that, so. Um, <coughs> let's see, fevers, um, under colds, coughs, and sore throats, it's really, uh, listed for fevers, reducing fevers, and that's just an extensive traditional use. I list the tribes specifically that have used it for that purpose um, in, in the book as well. Um, um, so, Yerba Buena, does anyone have this growing in their garden? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Um, so, it's a wonderful tea. Um, I like that it's listed as a love tea. Um, so I don't really have any real direct experience with that, but if you do, then let me know. Um, use it on a date or something. So um, anyway, that's these are some of the uses. Um, and uh, the approved use, the colic, um, you know, again, uh, is a traditional use for, for as a tea for babies. Um, and that's got an extensive uh, history of use for that purpose. Um, anyway, it's a wonderful plant. So in the book I have, I do these listings at the top of these icons, just indicating um, the type of water requirements that it likes. Um, it's 
sun, um, part shade, and that it's deer resistant in some cases. So each one of the plants has the icons on it um, to just make it easy to know how to use it. Um, so Doug fir, um, does anyone have Doug fir growing around here? It's, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, so this picture is um, some other fun ice cream ideas with native plants, but this is a fir tip sorbet is the one on the left. So um, that's kind of the lighter colored one. And then the, the one on the right is actually uh, made from California Bay. Um, so you can make a ice cream out of California Bay that's delicious. And that's the marzipan on top that you were tasting. Um, but fir is really a springtime um, plant as far as its medicinal use. The tips, if you notice the ends of the tips get bright green in color in the spring. Uh, has anyone noticed that? Um, so that bright green color, when you see that on the tip, that's the indicator that it's the highest content of vitamin C present in the tips of the fur. And so you can just gently pull the tips and uh, they'll, just the tip will come off and um, make that into a tea or you can freeze the tips um, for later use or you can dry them for later use. So uh, again, an important thing with this is that you have a pretty narrow window on most of these plants as to when um, it's the right time to collect that particular part of the plant that you want to use for food or tea or medicine. And um, so you can't really procrastinate. So it's another reason that gets you outside um, and another excuse to, to spend time with the plants. Um, but again, when you see the <coughs> green tips, um, that's when it's the highest in vitamin C. Um, and uh, it's also yeah, effective for uh, urinary tract infections and um, as a support for kidneys. And that is the tea. Um, and, uh, Anyway, I, the jewelry thing on there for the cultural and functional art um, is I've got a picture in there of, in the book of if you take the tips of the Doug fir branches and you just strip off some of the leaves, um, and this can be any time of year. Um, this is something they were used by the Maidu uh, to make these little rings that you can then turn into either skirts or necklaces or earrings, um, but it's just basically taking the little tip of the, the branch without the needles on it and then um, twisting it into a circle and tying it against itself. And they're just beautiful. So um, anyway, that's a fun, a fun use as well. Um, so there's some highlights from spring. And uh, as far as summer, now you'll notice there's a lot of uses listed. Um, and sometimes this can get overwhelming. You know, where do you begin? Um, and then a part of me, when I was first learning about some of the uses of plants and things, I just sort of wanted to shut off. I'm like, if it's good for that many different things, then it really can't be good for anything. You know, there's a sort of cynic in us that thinks, well, you know, how could they be useful for that many things? But um, in some cases, they, they really are. Um, uh, and, and manzanita is one that's my one of my very favorites. Um, so this is um, from the Arctostaphylus uh, viscida, and uh, I'm going to pass this around. This is a sugar, and you can just sprinkle it on your hand and taste some if you'd like. Um, but when I call it a sugar, all I mean is that I take the berry, um, and you you gather them in the summer. Um, and you want to gather them when they're dark, kind of orangish red in color. Um, that's when they're ripe. And the nice thing about the manzanita berries, unlike most berries, is that they're dry on the bush. So if you squeeze the manzanita berry, um, which I'll, I'll just kind of do here, you'll see that it has this powdery um, stuff inside of it. Well, that powder is what I'm calling the sugar. So there's really nothing, if you just, squeezed your manzanita berry and ate the sugar just like that, that's fine too, if that's all you want to do. Um, but if you want to really start using it, um, adding it to cereal or baking muffins with it or doing other things with it, um, you're really just trying to remove the seed. It has a seed in the center that's just not very tasty to crunch down on. 
So that's the only thing um, that you're trying to separate out. So what I do with the manzanita, now on the cover you'll see a picture of um, my friend Grayson. He is um, doing it in a more traditional way. Um, so he's taking the manzanita berries and he's crushing them with a the rock and um, doing it like that, um, which is fine to do as well. Um, what I tend to do, um, just to make it a little easy for myself, is I just take the berries and I put them in, you can either use a food processor, uh, Cuisinart, uh, you know, blender, uh, Vitamix, anything like that, and I just put the berries in, uh, put it on low, so just uh, one or two, um, and then grind it for about two minutes, just to crush it up, that's all you're doing is crushing it up. And then I put it into a um, strainer, uh, like a mesh strainer, and take a wooden spoon with a bowl underneath, and I just go like that, and the sugar comes right out. So, And then that sugar keeps, um, for a long time, the manzanita berries store very well. So if you just take a walk in the summer, gather your manzanita berries, and put them in a basket or a bag, you, again, you don't need to do a lot of extensive drying with it. It's a very, very easy plant to get started with. Um, and then you can keep that for a whole year till the next, um, next season. Um, and then just make it into the sugar as needed or make it in, into the sugar and store it in a, in a jar. Um, so some of the things I like to do once I have, have the sugar, um, again, you tasted the manzanita cider. I've been experimenting with different ways of making it. Um, today I did a more traditional method, which is just with um, water. So you just take cold water and pour it over the crushed berries. And um, I actually do that after I've taken the sugar out. So I make my sugar, and I have leftover kind of seeds and the skins, and some sugar is still in that. And I just use that to um, the traditional way to do it is to just take two bowls and have your mesh strainer with the leftovers in it, like the leftover seeds and skin, pour water over that, and then take that same water, move your mesh strainer to the other bowl, and pour it over again. So you just do that about seven or eight times, and that's about it. Um, so that's a traditional way, or you can simmer it um, for about 20 minutes. And take, again, I just use the seeds in the skin after I've taken the sugar out, um, just so I can use all the parts of, of the manzanita. And I find that it's sweet enough, but you could just crush it <coughs> and, and do the same process without separating out the sugar if you want. Um, but once I've got the sugar, again, I, I make um, crackers um, out of it. It's just like a flour, so it's a gluten-free, antioxidant-rich flour. So you can do anything that you would normally bake use uh, flour for, you can use with the manzanita. Um, so you can make crackers, muffins, um, you can just take the sugar and add it to, to granola or cereal, um, or you can make a delicious, really good vinaigrette salad dressing. So, um, in the blossoms I do like to eat raw, put on salads, uh, and also make into a, a jelly. And, those are great because the blossoms are there early, um, in the very early spring. Um, does anyone have questions on the food uses of the manzanita? Um, as far as medicine, um, I put urinary tract approved um, because it is approved as an official medicine in, in many countries around the world. It's Arctostaphylus uva ursi um, that is the approved species for urinary tract infections, and that's the leaf um, used as a tea. So, um, yes. You said you use the viscida. Does that have larger berries or more sugar, or is you it just can use, It's just whatever is in abundance around okay. you. So it's it's available. Whatever manzanita species you have uh, locally that's in abundance is, is fine to use. Um, I do also use it for poison oak, um, and that's externally the leaf. And um, does anybody ever has anybody ever gotten poison oak before? No, no. A few people. Yeah. So you know, some of these things are very practical problems that I'm trying to solve. So mosquitoes, uh, poison oak, uh, but poison oak, the leaves are very astringent, 
you don't drink it. You just make a tea out of the leaves for external use. And I just, again, put it in a spray bottle and I spray it on the rash and it dries it up. Um, so it's really effective for, um, for poison oak. Um, okay. Um, here's a picture of the vinaigrette. And just, these are the baskets of manzanita berries. So yeah, I have basket after basket of manzanita berries because again, I, I do find that I use it as, uh, use a lot more than I anticipated. So each year, um, my family has gathered more than the year before. So um, and here's another um, favorite in the summer, um, Ceanothus. So there's many different species of Ceanothus. Um, the one that I have uh, growing near me um, that I use for this purpose um, is Integoremus, Ceanothus Integoremus, and it's um, also sometimes referred to as wild lilac. Um, but you'll see this green uh, mysterious powder there is really the leaves, the dried leaves that are just ground up. Um, and then I, I use that as a tea. And um, it's another one that I sent to the laboratory for testing um, because I was curious. I'd been doing some reading about it being very similar to green tea um, in terms of its properties. And it does have very similar catechins and antioxidants as green tea. The profile is almost exactly the same. Um, as far as the health benefits of green tea, our Ceanothus is um, a very good substitute, local substitute. Um, but it doesn't have the caffeine. So a caffeine-free uh, source of, of that, those catechins, and it's very stimulating though. Even without the green tea, it is um, invigorating. So, I mean, I'm sorry, without the green tea, without the caffeine. Um, did you have a question? You answered it. Answered it, okay. Um, is it only that variety? I am trying to taste as many varieties as I can. So if you have a lot of other varieties growing near you um, and you feel ambitious and would like to, to taste some, I'd love to get some more feedback on other species. So you take the flowers and then you dry them and then you pour hot water in them? No, actually in this case it's the leaves. That's a little misleading because there's a beautiful picture of the flower, um, but this is just the leaves um, that I use for the tea. The flowers are useful um, for, as making a soap. Um, they, they are uh, a traditional soap, and you basically just add water to the flower and rub it, and it lathers up, and you can use it as a soap or shampoo or... Would you dry them first? Um, that you do not need to dry. No, you would just use the fresh flowers for that. Um, no, 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 I'm after the tea. Oh, I'm sorry, going back to the tea. Yeah, the, the tea, the leaves, you do not have to dry them first. You can make a tea out of the fresh leaves. Um, <laughs> You don't need to grind them either. You can just, you know, put a few leaves in a cup and pour the hot water over it. What I have found with the tea is, if you've noticed with green tea, it will get bitter if you let it steep too long. So the same thing happens with this. You can only want to steep it for two to three minutes. Um, you don't want to steep it too long because it will get, it will become bitter. So. Is there a particular time of the year that's best to harvest the leaves? Um, you know, it's it's loose, it's like semi-deciduous, this, this variety of this species. Um, so I find um, spring and summer and fall even is fine, but um, yeah, it's, it's you know just really not as many in the in the winter. So um, let's see, it's also traditionally used for colds. Um, I have also been experimenting with that, using it in this winter for that. Um, externally, the poison oak, that's with the flowers. Um, so I just add it in to my other plants that I use for keeping poison oak uh, away, like the manzanita leaf, um, and uh, weight loss, and that's the tea. Um, yeah, the baskets, this is a basket made out of See, note this. So this is woven out of uh, the sea note this. So just one of the stems coming up. So uh, a friend of mine makes baskets out of sea note this. And it is one that was traditionally used more as a work basket. So this isn't a beautiful basket like um, 
you know, some of the nature <coughs> baskets, but it's very useful. Is a sea note. This is known for being very um, hardy and sturdy. So, I mean, you can see I carry acorns and rocks and all kinds of heavy things in this, and I've had this one for years, and it's just uh, very sturdy. So, <coughs> sea note this basket. Um, let's see, mugwort. Everyone love and know mugwort. Um, another one of my favorites. Um, so this is a list of some of the plants that I combine to make a poison oak spray. And again, you don't have to worry if you don't have all the plants. If you just use what you've got, that's fine. Um, and like I said before, making it as simple as just having a glass jar and boiling water and then putting the plants in, in the jar and covering it with water and letting it steep four hours to overnight. And then straight it into an empty little uh, spray bottle if you've got something like that is a handy form to, to have it in. And I just leave it, I keep it, I make it, it, it stays, you know, I keep it for the summer. You know, I make a batch and it, it lasts um, for several months, so. Um, bug repellent, if you're ever walking along and being attacked by mosquitoes and you happen to see a patch of mugwort there, <laughs> That is your friend, um, and it is not a friend of mosquitoes. They don't like the strong essential oils in um, these plants like mugwort, um, so if you just rub it on your skin, uh, that really repels, uh, repels the mosquitoes. Um, you know, my, my, one of my Maidu friends talks about mugwort um, as just having so many uses. So it's, it's one of those plants, again, that was used traditionally for a range of ailments, just a lot of things not going well for you. <laughs> they would drink mugwort tea. Um, and it, the tea is not tasty, I won't <laughs> lie to you, um, but it is, it's drinkable. It's not, it's not terrible, but it's just not, not too tasty. Um, and purification ceremony, they, they were used, it was burned, so it was dry, just like um, white sage is. Um, you can dry mugwort and, and burn that. Um, and some people um, like to put it under their pillow as a dream enhancer. So I Does it flower? Uh, mugwort? Yes. Just uh, inconspicuous yeah. flowers, um, you know, that aren't, aren't that noticeable, but um, yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful plant. Um, about either of these. Are you all familiar with these? Um, the gooseberry uh, is a little intimidating in the sense of biting into one um, because of its big spines. But it is very <coughs> delicious. And the juice, um, the juice made from gooseberries tastes just like guava juice. It is delicious. And it's this, it turns this amazing color of, of guava juice. It's just incredible. So. Um, anyway, I make the juice out of it just by crushing the berries. You can take a stick, um, and if you gently, if you have a basket, like this basket or any basket, and you, you have a stick, and you gently touch the gooseberry bush, the um, fruits will fall into your basket. So that is a trick. Um, you can also wear gloves and hold them with the gloves, but the easiest thing is to just gently tap the bush and mm -hmm. the right. The right ones will fall off, and the ones that aren't right won't. So, uh, yes, did you have a question? Is it uh, only that ripening species, or is it? No, there's so many. I mean, there's other species of currant that are absolutely delicious. Um, so, yeah, I'm just showing the gooseberry here, um, but uh, yeah, that's one of my favorites. Um, the the uh, all the ripe species. So I'm just showing this one here um, because I kind of fell in love with it over the summer and got over my issues with the spines and really was able to, to enjoy it. Um, but other currants are really delicious too. So um, if you try uh, ripe florium, 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 florium. florium. Yeah. Oh, the golden, yeah. the golden yeah. currant. Yeah, that one's good too. Yeah, and the nevidense, uh, nevidense. That's um, maybe a little higher in elevation. That one's got a delicious um, dark blue berry. So um, anyway.
again, I'm trying to grow as much of this as possible. I don't encourage people to go out into the wild and be collecting plants. I mean, the emphasis of the book and everything that I'm doing is to really encourage people to grow these around their homes and then enjoy them um, for their own family's food and, and medicine. So um, elderberry is uh, another wonderful one. Uh, here's a use that's um, kind of definitely traditional. Uh, this is a clapper made from elderberry. Um, I don't know if you've, you've heard one of these. But this is a percussive instrument. So it um, was used um, instead of a drum they would be using an elderberry clapper um, traditionally. So um, it's just hollowed out elderberry. And um, other things with elderberry, elderberry is one that also has a lot of science on it. Um, the European species uh, used for the immune system, antiviral. Uh, it's my friend when I have the flu. So elderberry uh, syrup, um, is amazing. Whenever I gather the elderberry, I go ahead and make the syrup um, for my family uh, for the winter. So whenever we're going to get our colds and people aren't feeling well, um, I already have the elderberry syrup made. And then I just can it up. And, uh, and it's sold commercially in the health food stores uh, as an antiviral. Um, so it's, it's very effective. Um, you can also make elderberry wine. Um, yes. So a lot of sources suggest that most parts of the elderberry plant are poisonous, including green berries. Yeah, you have to take the ripe berries. Um, they get a whitish uh, sheen on the berries when they're really ripe, so you'll see that the blue kind of almost turns white. Um, and you don't use any of the other parts of the elderberry. Um, you have to use the ripe berries. And you don't eat them raw. You eat them either dried. So drying them is fine. So drying them and then adding them to breads and things is one, one way of doing it. Um, or if you cook them. Um, but you know it is something that has some toxicity if you eat them raw. So um, that's a good, good thing to point out. Um, and that's how they were also used traditionally, was either cooked or dried. Um, so fall, um, the furthest season from us right now, but um, madrone, do you all have uh, madrones anywhere around you? I saw quite a few on Highway 17 um, driving from Santa Cruz today. So they're just lying the highway, and they're covered right now with the berries still. So um, even though it's past fall, um, they still have quite a few berries on them. So if you do have one near you, you should check it for berries. The berries are at the very top of the tree, so if you're not paying attention, you might not notice um, when it has berries on it. Um, but you can collect them. They're usually all over the base of the, of the tree where, they, where they've fallen. And um, it's, it's really one of my favorites. Um, the, I use them raw. Um, just add it in to stir fries. They keep really well in the refrigerator, or you can freeze them, um, uh, or you can dry them, and again, do something like this, kind of dry them and grind up the berries and keep them in a, a spice jar. And um, Remember, they were one of the ones that were tested um, as having the high quantity of, of antioxidants, so um, it's a good one to add in. Does anyone have access to a madrone tree? A few people? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really beautiful tree. It's a little hard to grow if it wasn't already there. But um, And the, the bark is also useful. Um, so the bark makes a delicious tea. So uh, that's something to try if you haven't already tasted that. Um, it's really delicious. And again, just with steeping it, put a few pieces of the bark. The bark kind of crumbles off of the madrone. And you can just put a few pieces of bark in. Um, to your teacup and pour hot water over it and let it steep for about 10 minutes and then um, strain out the bark. Um, madrone, this is a sauce I try uh, for Thanksgiving to make an all native um, Thanksgiving dinner uh, with my family. So one of the things we've done, instead of cranberry sauce, we make a madrone berry sauce. And um, you can add a, a little toyon into it as well to make it a little tangier, um, but this is a really delicious uh, cranberry substitute. Um, 
And then the flowers are great. The flowers are really um, delicious, just raw. So This is a picture of some necklaces that I like to make out of Maduro berries, too. If you string the berries when they are um, moist and let them dry, then you can make them. Necklaces. Okay, into the oak, um, our oak nut, right? Um, okay, okay on time? Uh, it's, it's about uh, almost 10 after. Almost 10 after. Yeah, okay. okay. So you still have plenty of time. Okay, so what I um, did here was try to make it simple. Now these are our black oaks, um, but you can gather all species of oak have edible acorns. So you don't have to worry if you're not sure exactly what species of oak you have um, growing in your yard or nearby. Um, they all have edible acorns. But the reason I like these and uh, the valley oaks have larger sized acorns is it's just a lot of work to go through if the acorn isn't larger in size. So um, you know, it's, it doesn't stop you if you're determined. You can do it with the small ones too, but um, it's nice if they're larger. So I was showing um, a few people before the talk started um, the different steps, but there's really four basic steps to turning acorns into flour. Um, has anyone done this before? You mentioned you've done a lot of acorn bread. Um, but step one is a great step because all it is is you take a walk in a nice fall day and you gather up your acorns. So everybody can do step one, I'm, I'm sure of it. Um, you just have to have a bag or a basket and um, gather up the acorns. Now, when you're gathering them, if you know, happen to notice that there's a little hole in your acorn, or the acorn just doesn't quite look right, the top is kind of mashed, or it looks sort of moldy or something, you know, just don't bother collecting that. Um, if it has a hole in it, it means something is living in it and you don't really want to eat it for dinner um, unless you like bugs for dinner. Um, so some people do, but I usually try to, to throw those out. Now, if you don't notice the hole, it's okay. So don't panic because this process, you won't have to worry about it either way. So anyway, you, you gather the acorns, and then what I do is I just put them in a bag or a basket and I keep them next to a heat source until spring. So that they're really dried out. So if you have a near where your heater vent comes in, or uh, you have to have a fireplace or a wood stove, you want to keep your acorns there and just let them really dry out. Um, that helps season them. So that's kind of helps in the seasoning, and it also makes them a lot easier to crack um, and process. So you don't have to do that, but that's um, something that's that's a good idea to do. Um, and then once they're dry. Um, and these store really well. So if you only get through step one and you forget about the acorns and you forget about everything else I said tonight, but you just gathered your acorns and then two years from now you remember, oh, you know, I wonder what she was saying. I'm going to go on the CNPS <coughs> website and look at the video and <laughs> I still got my acorns. So they're fine. They'll keep for years. This is your food security. So if you're concerned about food security, um, just take a walk outside and gather your acorns. Um, so step two is really to um, crack the acorns and that can be done uh, a lot of different ways. You can do a traditional way of just like that um, with two rocks and you crack open your acorn. Here's your acorn. Um, or you can take a hammer and a cutting board and do it that way. It's just a simple one, you know, one to two hits at the most with an acorn, uh, with a hammer. If you really whack your acorn, uh, you know, it's going to smash into a million pieces and things are going to go flying everywhere. So uh, it's really a fun activity to do. Um, I'm sorry we're not going to really have time to have more of an interactive experience tonight, but usually when we put out the acorns and everybody's got their hammers and cutting boards and you start whacking at the acorns, it's really relaxing. So it's actually a really fun <laughs> so way noisy. to reduce stress. So, you know, and nobody cares about anything else I'm talking about as long as they can just keep cracking their acorns. So it just, it's, uh, it's actually really fun. So um, anyway, and all ages can do, can do this. This is it's really simple. 
Um, and then what I do is step three is I grind them up into smaller pieces. And that just exposes more surface um, area to the water. Um, I have a, three different methods listed in my book of how to process acorns. And everybody has their own particular way. I'm just showing you what I've decided is the easiest way for me to do. Um, I cover the, I grind the, the acorns up, cover them with water. So, you know, in this instance, I, I'm not normally making small amounts like this. I'm usually making, you know, large um, gallon jars or, you know, a quart jar is fine. Um, but you want to have about a fourth of the jar filled with the acorns and the rest water. Um, and then I just, twice a day, I keep it in my kitchen. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. I just pour out the, the water as much as I can of it. You know, just keeping the acorns in, pour out the water, add fresh water. And then, you know, kind of shake it a little bit. And then, uh, you know, about seven days from then, it's completely leached. Um, the way you can tell, you're taking out the tannins. Um, so if you had a seasonal creek in the, your backyard, um, you could do it a tradition, more traditional manner and grind up your acorns and then put them in a, a bag or pillowcase and keep them in your seasonal creek. And that would be a, an easy way to do it as well. But if you don't have a seasonal creek in your backyard and you just want to do it in your kitchen, again, um, it's very simple. Just cover the acorns with water, change the water in the morning. Now, if you forgot to change the water, oh my gosh, you know, it's still going to be fine. So, you know, you can, you can change it, the water the next day. It just might take another day or two to leach. You're pulling out the tannins. The tannic acid is what makes um, acorns bitter and not taste good to us. So, if you say six days have gone by, and you're draining the water out and you taste one piece of your acorn and it tastes kind of bitter. It tastes bitter. It's not done yet. It shouldn't taste bitter at all. Oftentimes people have tried acorns and said, oh, they didn't taste good and it's because they weren't leached long enough or properly. And if they taste bitter, they're just, they just need another day or two. And that, that's fine. You just keep doing the same process. And when it's done, um, when they're done, you just dry them, and you can do that on a cookie sheet, in the oven on 200, you can do it out in the sun, um, you can do it next to your um, wood stove or fireplace. Um, and then I grind it into a flour, and this is again just what I've done because it's the easiest way for me to integrate this into my daily life, is I use flour, and so here's my flour substitute, and I just have it ready to go. Um, I grind it into a finer flour. And again, this can be done in a food processor, Vitamix blender. And then I keep it, once it's in this stage, it's more perishable. So I do keep it in the fridge um, once it's in this stage. Or you can freeze it. Um, when it's in this stage of the nut, it's not, it's not perishable. You know, again, you can keep this, as long as it's properly dry, you can keep this for a long time. Um, and then once it's here, you can substitute it. Look at all the different kinds of recipes. Um, you guys, the brave ones, tried the open Mars pan. Did anyone not try this that would like uh, some? Maybe so you could pass delicious. this. We're going to pass this around and don't be shy. <laughs> he, he you want to? Oh, okay, he didn't get to try it. Yeah. So, um, so again, desserts are a nice way to, to introduce yourself to wild food uh, enjoyment. So. Um, Again, I make a bliss bars, muffins, um, this Mars pan that you're tasting. I make a pie crust out of the flour. I mean, anything that you use flour for, you can substitute acorn flour. Um, but it, it doesn't have the gluten. It doesn't rise. It's more dense. And so you might need to mix it with another flour if you're wanting to have um, a regular kind of bread uh, that you're used to. Uh, but again, if you're using it as a, as a pie crust or in these other recipes, it doesn't really matter that, that it's dense because it's, it's still really delicious. Yes, did you have a question? Would you compare it to almond flour? Yes, it's, it's very similar to so if I another nut that flour. That included that and it could substitute? It substitutes really well, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, here's some pictures. Um, this is the marzipan that you're tasting right now. And this is a picture of a bliss bar that I make with the acorn flour and coconut and that sort of thing. So.
as you can see, my kids have influenced the recipes that have gotten included, so those um, are the ones they like. Um, so Oregon grape, um, does everyone, does people have this growing in their yard or garden, that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, there's different species of uh, the Aquifolium, there's also a repens, it's um, a more lower growing uh, variety. Uh, but <clears throat> Oregon grape, um, you know, the berries are edible. They're not delicious in my experience, um, but they are edible. Um, I have made jelly out of the berries, and that's, that's been tasty. Um, what it's used for primarily um, and sold commercially for this use is um, has everyone heard of golden seal? Um, it's a substitute for golden seal. It has a compound in it called berberine that is uh, found in, in a variety of different types of plants, but it's, there's an extensive amount in Oregon grapefruit, and it's a yellow. If you've ever seen a root of your Oregon grapefruit, um, you'll notice that it's, it's bright yellow. And that bright yellow is an indicator of the berberine that's in, in the, the root. And that berberine fights infection. It's incredible uh, for fighting flus. Um, once you've got a really serious infection that you're trying to get out of your system, um, you can just take a little piece of the root and um, chop it up and boil it, make it into a tea. Um, again, I'm telling you how to make things as a tea because that's just the easiest thing. Um, you know, if you can boil water, then it's, it's just really simple way to start um, accessing the world of uh, native plant uses. And anyway, it's, it's really effective for, for that purpose. And it is, it is sold in health food stores and that sort of thing for, um, for flu symptoms. Um, but it's also got a lot of science on it for psoriasis. So it's got um, clinical trials, placebo controlled, um, extensive trials for psoriasis, so used externally. Um, making it into an extract and then adding beeswax and you use it as a salve. Um, so I also have the recipe for that as well. And that's not available in stores, so it's something that you have to, to make yourself. Um, but it does have a lot of science on it. Um, let's see. Yerba Santa. Is anyone familiar with? Yes, did you have Oh, a I just wanted to tell you probably about 10, 10 more minutes. minutes. Okay. We're, okay. Room. we're almost done. No problem. This is the last no slide. Um, yerba Santa, if you tasted, if you're brave and tasted the Yerba Santa ice cream that I brought, if you didn't, um, I still have some. Um, it's made, it's vegan, so it's made with coconut milk, um, and it's medicinal ice cream, so what could be better than that? Um, <laughs> anyway, it's got the Yerba Santa in it, and Yerba Santa uh, was listed um, in 1894. It was officially recognized um, in our our government had a United States pharmacopoeia that used to include plants. Um, and Yerba Santa was one of the plants. Um, and it was officially listed in there for bronchitis. So 1894, U.S. pharmacopoeia had um, Yerba Santa listed uh, for bronchitis. It was used for that purpose. Um, and uh, its traditional use is also for congestion in, in the lungs. So again, these two things are, are in alignment. Um, it's incredibly effective. It's not terribly tasty. Um, some people, my husband likes the, the taste of your Santa, but, um, but it does work. It's very effective in clearing congestion. And I just make a tea from the leaves. So you're using the leaves of the Yerba Santa. Spring leaves? <clears throat> I actually, the fall is really the best time. Um, but you can tell when it has, when they look really oily. Um, you'll notice the leaves get, I don't know if you've really noticed, your plant ends up getting this oily kind of sheen on it. Um, and it can start earlier than the fall. It can, be, it can be summer or even late spring. But when it gets really this healthy oil on it, that's, that's when it's the most medicinal for that purpose. So, and it's really easy to collect and dry and just have in a jar or hanging somewhere um, in your house for, for the whole year. So, you know, it's again a real easy one to add in. So are you using the whole plant or just the leaves? Just the leaves, yeah. And again, with this, it's really easy to, you know, you're not harming the plant. You're going to just take, you know, a few leaves from, from each part of different plants. And it, it doesn't, it, the plant is fine. Um, 
And uh, you can also chew if you're ever walking or hiking. And um, <clears throat> my, again, one of my Native American friends, um, he always talks about using it for fresh breath. So that's his little secret. If his, he's noticing his breath is not smelling too good, um, just reaches down and gets a little leaf of yerba santa and uh, sucks on it, and it does freshen your breath. It's, if you bite into it, it goes into a little more bitter flavor, but if you just suck on it, it is very um, hydrating too. It moistens your mouth and uh, gives you fresh breath. So you can't really see the quote here, but anyway, the idea with what I'm doing and what I hope you'll do is to go and be adventurous about what's in your own backyard and really start to try to use um, our native plants for food and health and um, you know, have it as a reason, another reason to grow native plants and connect deeply to our landscape. And I hope that if you do make any discoveries on your adventures, um, that you'll stay in touch and send me an email or give me a call and let me know what you discover. So thanks so much for coming and if you have any questions,